Let's continue. Chapter 21, Last Day. Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung from his neck. By looking out of the corner of his eye, he could see it. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like to, st to sit still, she said. I've always been rather quiet. Yes, but you seem specially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I feel peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live, secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come, then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world. For you, for you mean a great deal to Zuckerman, and he will not harm you, ever. Winter will pass, the days will lengthen, the ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing. The frogs will awake, the warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy, Wilbur, this lovely world, these precious days. Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eye. Oh, Charlotte, he said, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Why did you do all this for me? He asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little while, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all this trapping and eating flies. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. Well, said Wilbur, I'm no good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. I really would. I'm sure you would, and I thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back in the barn cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a voice so loud, low, Wilbur could hardly hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur leapt to his feet. Not going back, he cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I'll be dead. I haven't even strength enough to climb down into the crate. I doubt if I have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in an agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs racked his body. He heaved and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned, Charlotte, my true friend. Come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur, stop thrashing about. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Zuckerman and Lurvy and John Arable and the others will be back any minute now, and they'll shove you into that crate and away you'll go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There would be no one to feed you. The fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced round and round the pen. Suddenly he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack and the 514 little spiders that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte herself was in a, unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of his pen. He put his front feet up on the top board and gazed around. In the distance, he saw the Arables and the Zuckermans approaching. He knew he would have to act quickly. Where's Templeton, he demanded. 
He's in that corner under the straw, asleep, said Charlotte. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the rat and tossed him into the air. Templeton, screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, surprised out of a sound sleep, looked first dazed, then disgusted. What kind of monkey shine is this, he growled. Can't a rat catch a wink of sleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She has only a short time to live. She cannot accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her egg sack with me. I can't reach it and I can't climb. You are the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up and get the egg sack. The rat yawned. He straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust, so it's old Templeton to the rescue again, is it? Templeton do this, Templeton do that. Templeton, please run down to the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend me a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur, hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. He began imitating Wilbur's voice. So it's hurry up, Templeton, is it, he said. Ho, ho, and what thanks do I ever get for these services, I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton, only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. Never a kind word for a rat. Templeton, said Wilbur in desperation, if you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up. Templeton lay back in the straw. Lazily, he placed his forepaws behind his head and crossed his knees in an attitude of complete relaxation. Die of a broken heart, he mimicked. How touching. My, my. I notice that it's always me you come to when in trouble, but I've never heard of anyone's heart breaking on my account. Oh, no. Who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton grinned and lay still. Who made trip after trip to the dump, he asked. Why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away with a rotten goose egg? Bless my soul, I believe it was old Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after you had fainted in front of the crowd? Old Templeton. Has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am anyway? A rat of all work? Wilbur was desperate. The people were coming and the rat was failing him. Suddenly he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get Charlotte's egg sack for me and from now on I will let you eat first. When Lurvy slops me, I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough and I won't touch a thing until you're through. The rat sat up. You mean that, he said? I promise, I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from his last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself slowly to the ceiling. He crept along till he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had strength enough to move a little. Then Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads that fastened the sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. Use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single one of those eggs harmed. This doth stick in my mouth, complained the rat. It's worth than caramel candy. But Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground, where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this as long as I live. Neither will I, said the rat, picking his teeth. I feel as though I'd eaten a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got out of sight just in time. 
Lurvy and John Arable and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment, followed by Mrs. Arable and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one way possible. He carefully took the little bundle in his mouth and held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered what Charlotte had told him, that the sack was waterproof and strong. It felt funny on his tongue and made him drool a bit. And of course he couldn't say anything, but as he was being shoved into the crate, he looked up at Charlotte and gave her a wink. She knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could, and she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, she whispered. Then she summoned all her strength and waved with one of her front legs at him. She never moved again. Next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart and the race horses were being loaded into vans and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fairgrounds were soon deserted. The sheds and buildings were empty and forlorn. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had visited the fair knew that a gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. That's the end of chapter 21. Yes, that's a rough one. <laughs> Chapter 22, A Warm Wind. And so Wilbur came home to his beloved manure pile in the barn cellar. His was a strange homecoming. Around his neck, he wore a medal of honor. In his mouth, he held a sack of spider's eggs. There is no place like home, Wilbur thought, as he placed Charlotte's 514 unborn children carefully in a safe corner. The barn smelled good. His friends, the sheep and the geese, were glad to see him back. The geese gave him a noisy welcome. Congratu, congratu, congratulations, they cried. Nice work. Mr. Zuckerman took the medal from Wilbur's neck and hung it on a nail over the pig pen, where visitors could examine it. Wilbur himself could look at it whenever he wanted to. In the days that followed, he was very happy. He grew to a great size. He no longer worried about being killed, for he knew that Mr. Zuckerman would keep him as long as he lived. Wilbur often thought of Charlotte. A few strands of her old web still hung in the doorway. Every day, Wilbur would stand and look at the torn, empty web, and a lump would come to his throat. No one had ever had such a friend, so affectionate, so loyal, and so skillful. The autumn days grew shorter. Lurvy brought the squashes and pumpkins in from the garden and piled them on the barn floor where they wouldn't get nipped on frosty nights. The maples and birches turned bright colors and the wind shook them and they dropped their leaves one by one on the ground. Under the wild apple trees in the pasture, the red little apples lay thick on the ground and the sheep gnawed them and the geese gnawed them and the foxes came in the night and sniffed them. One evening, just before Christmas, snow began to fall. It covered house and barn and fields and woods. Wilbur had never seen snow before. When morning came, he went out and plowed the drifts in his yard for the fun of it. Fern and Avery arrived, dragging a sled. They coasted down the lane and out onto the frozen pond in the pasture. Coasting is the most fun there is, said Avery. The most fun there is, retorted Fern, is when the Ferris wheel stops and Henry and I are in the top car and Henry makes the car swing and we can see everything for miles and miles and miles. Goodness, are you still thinking about that old Ferris wheel? said Avery in disgust. The fair was weeks and weeks ago. I think about it all the time, said Fern, picking snow from her ear. After Christmas, the thermometer dropped to 10 below zero. Cold settled on the world. The pasture was bleak and frozen. The cows stayed in the barn all the time now, except on sunny mornings when they went out and stood at the barnyard in the lee of the straw pile. The sheep stayed near the barn too, for protection. When they were thirsty, they ate snow. 
The geese hung around the barnyard the way boys hang around a drugstore, and Mr. Zuckerman fed them corn and turnips to keep them cheerful. Many, many thanks, they always said when they saw food coming. Templeton moved indoors when winter came. His ratty home under the pig trough was too chilly, so he fixed himself a cozy nest in the barn behind the grain bins. He lined it with bits of dirty newspapers and rags, and whenever he found a trinket or a keepsake, he carried it home and stored it there. He continued to visit Wilbur three times a day, exactly at mealtime, and Wilbur kept the promise he had made. Wilbur let the rat eat first, then, when Templeton couldn't hold another mouthful, Wilbur would eat. As a result of overeating, Templeton grew bigger and fatter than any rat you ever saw. He was gigantic. He was as big as a young woodchuck. The old sheep spoke to him about his size one day. You would live longer, said the old sheep, if you ate less. Who wants to live forever, sneered the rat. I am naturally a heavy eater, and I get untold satisfaction from the pleasures of the feast. He patted his stomach, grinned at the sheep, and crept upstairs to lie down. All winter, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as though he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure for the sack, next to the board fence. On very cold nights, he lay so that his breath would warm it. For Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this small round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he waited the end of winter and the coming of the little spiders. Life is always a rich and steady time when you are waiting for something to happen or to hatch. The winter ended at last. I heard the frogs today, said the old sheep one evening. Listen, you can hear them now. Wilbur stood still and cocked his ears. From the pond, in shrill chorus, came the voices of hundreds of little frogs. Springtime, said the old sheep thoughtfully, another spring. As she walked away, Wilbur saw a new lamb following her. It was only a few hours old. The snows melted and ran away. The streams and ditches bubbled and chattered with rushing water. A sparrow with a streaky breast arrived and sang. The light strengthened. The mornings came sooner. Almost every morning there was another new lamb in the sheepfold. The goose was sitting on nine eggs. The sky seemed wider and a warm wind blew. The last remaining strands of Charlotte's old web floated away and vanished. One fine sunny morning after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching his precious sack. He wasn't thinking of anything much. As he stood there, he noticed something move. He stepped closer and stared. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It was no bigger than a grain of sand, no bigger than the head of a pin. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan. It looked just like Charlotte. Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved at him. Then Wilbur looked more closely. Two more little spiders crawled out and waved. They climbed round and round on the sack, exploring their new world. Then three more little spiders, then eight, then ten. Charlotte's children were here at last. Wilbur's heart pounded. He began to squeal. Then he raced in circles, kicking manure into the air. Then he turned a backflip. Then he planted his front feet and came to a stop in front of Charlotte's children. Hello there, he said. The first spider said hello, but its voice was so small, Wilbur couldn't hear it. I am an old friend of your mother, said Wilbur. I am glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? The little spiders waved their forelegs at him. Wilbur could see by the way they acted that they were glad to see him. Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything you need? The young spiders just waved. For several days and several nights, they crawled here and there, up and down, around and about, waving at Wilbur, trailing tiny drag lines behind them and exploring their home. There were dozens and dozens of them, 
Wilbur couldn't count them, but he knew that he had a great many new friends. They grew quite rapidly. Soon, each was as big as a BB shot. They made tiny webs near the sack. Then came a quiet morning when Mr. Zuckerman opened a door on the north side. A warm draft of rising air blew softly through the barn cellar. The air smelled of the damp earth, of the spruce woods, of the sweet springtime. The baby spiders felt the warm updrift. One spider climbed to the top of the fence. Then it did something that came as a great surprise to Wilbur. The spider stood on its head, pointed its spinnerets in the air, and let loose a cloud of fine silk. The silk formed a balloon. As Wilbur watched, the spider let go of the fence and rose into the air. Goodbye, it said as it sailed through the doorway. Wait a minute, screamed Wilbur. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider crawled to the top of the fence, stood on its head, made a balloon, and sailed away. Then another spider, then another. The air was soon filled with tiny balloons, each balloon carrying a spider. Wilbur was frantic. Charlotte's babies were disappearing at a great rate. Come back, children, he cried. Goodbye, they called. Goodbye, goodbye. At last, one little spider took time enough to stop and talk to Wilbur before making its balloon. We're leaving here on the warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We are aeronauts and we are going out into the world to make webs for ourselves. But where, asked Wilbur, wherever the wind takes us, high, low, near, far, east, west, north, south, we take to the breeze, we go as we please. Are all of you going, asked Wilbur. You can't all go. I would be left alone with no friends. Your mother wouldn't want that to happen, I'm sure. The air was now so full of balloonists that the barn cellar looked almost as though a mist had gathered. Balloons by the dozen were rising, circling and drifting away through the door, sailing off on the gentle wind. Cries of goodbye, goodbye, goodbye came weakly to Wilbur's ears. He couldn't bear to watch any more. In sorrow, he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seemed like the end of the world, to be deserted by Charlotte's children. Wilbur cried himself to sleep. When he woke, it was late afternoon. He looked at the egg sack. It was empty. He looked into the air. The balloonists were gone. Then he walked drearily to the doorway where Charlotte's web used to be. He was standing there thinking of her when he heard a small voice. Salutations, it said. I'm up here. So am I, said another tiny voice. So am I, said a third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place and we like you. Wilbur looked up. At the top of the doorway, three small webs were being constructed. On each web, working busily, was one of Charlotte's daughters. Can I take this to mean, asked Wilbur, that you have definitely decided to live here in the barn cellar and that I'm going to have three friends? You can indeed, said the spiders. What are your names, please, asked Wilbur, trembling with joy. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider, if you'll tell me why you are trembling. I'm trembling with joy, said Wilbur. Then my name is Joy, said the first spider. What was my mother's middle initial, asked the second spider. A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Aranea, said the spider. How about me, asked the third spider. Will you just pick out a nice sensible name for me? Something not too long, not too fancy, and not too silly? Wilbur thought hard. Nellie, he suggested. 
Fine, I like that very much, said the third spider. You may call me Nellie. She daintily fastened her orb line to the next spoke of the web. Wilbur's heart brimmed with happiness. He felt that he should make a short speech on this very important occasion. Joy, Aranea, Nellie, he began. Welcome to the barn cellar. You have chosen a hallowed doorway from which to string your webs. I think it is only fair to tell you that I was devoted to your mother. I owe my very life to her. She was brilliant, beautiful, and loyal to the end. I shall always treasure her memory. To you, her daughters, I pledge my friendship forever and ever. I pledge mine, said Joy. I do too, said Aranea. And so do I, said Nellie, who had just managed to catch a small gnat. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. As time went on and the months and years came and went, he was never without friends. Fern did not come regularly to the barn anymore. She was growing up and was careful to avoid childish things, like sitting on a milk stool near a pig pen. But Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, year after year, lived in the doorway. Each spring, there were new little spiders hatching out to take the place of the old. Most of them sailed away on their balloons, but always two or three stayed and set up housekeeping in the doorway. Mr. Zuckerman took fine care of Wilbur all the rest of his days, and the pig was often visited by friends and admirers, for nobody ever forgot the year of his triumph and the miracle of the web. Life in the barn was very good, night and day, winter and summer, spring and fall, dull days and bright days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur, this warm, delicious cellar with the garrulous geese, the changing seasons, the heat of the sun, the passage of swallows, the nearness of rats, the sameness of sheep, the love of spiders, the smell of manure, and the glory of everything. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte. Although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly, none of the new, sp new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself. It is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. The end. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for sticking around till the end. I know it was a longer story than what I normally read, but I thought it was worth it. Thanks.